Mr. President, I stand to talk about a looming crisis in this country, a problem that has the potential to affect every American from every state, from every political party, of every political ideology. That issue relates to our national debt. We've accumulated nearly $15 trillion in debt through the federal government, which is a lot of money. Split up among 300 million Americans, it works out to close to $50,000 a head. A lot of people don't make that much money in a year, and yet that's what every man, woman, and child owns just on a per capita basis the moment they're born. Now, if it's calculated out on the basis of debt per taxpayer, the number is much larger, anywhere between $120,000 and $150,000 per head, depending on how you calculate it, depending on whose numbers you figure. We're now approaching the August 2nd deadline given to us by Secretary Geithner that has been identified as the time by which we must increase our national debt yet again, a debt that has been raised time and time again, resulting in our accumulation of about $10 trillion of new debt in roughly the last decade. This is a problem, and it's a problem that's only going to become more severe the longer we kick this can down the road without doing anything about it to change the way Washington brings money in and the way Washington spends money. I want to talk for a minute first about how Washington brings money in. There are those who have suggested in this town very recently that what we need right now is a tax increase in order to address the debt crisis. I could not disagree more, and I need to state with the greatest emphasis that I'm able to place on this issue that a tax increase is something I would oppose and something that I would devote every ounce of energy in me to opposing. And the reason is we have in Washington something that is not a revenue problem. What we have is a spending problem. The spending is the crisis that we need to address. But on a more fundamental level, we have to remember what we do when we raise taxes. When we raise taxes, we chill investment. It's investment that we rely on for the creation of jobs. Because we have to remember, the government doesn't have the power to create jobs because it can't create wealth. It can create policies, and it can adopt laws and regulations designed to promote or deter certain kinds of behavior. It can raise revenue through taxation. But it can't really create wealth. All it can do is set in place certain circumstances that might allow wealth to be created, or in other circumstances, might deter new wealth from being created. To have two, true wealth creation, leading to true job creation, you have to have a circumstance in which willing investors with capital ready to invest have the reasonable assurance and promise that if they invest their money and thereby place it at risk, that any gains resulting from that risky behavior will be gains that inure to their benefit and not taken away by some third party and not taken away by the government. So when we raise taxes, in effect what we're doing is deterring investment. Deterring investment at a time when we're hemorrhaging jobs and we can ill afford to lose any more. Not one more job should be lost as a result of something that the government does. We need to find ways to get the government out of the way so that job creation can occur but it can't occur whenever we punish the investor, whenever we tell the investor, invest at your own risk, because if you dare to make a profit, we're going to take away more of that money uh, than we have previously been taking away in taxes. For that reason, Mr. President, I continue to emphasize the fact that I will oppose any attempt to address this debt limit crisis by raising taxes, and I will continue to oppose any effort to raise taxes. Spending is the problem. Now, as to the question of how Washington spends money, if the definition of insanity is the practice of doing something again and again, intending or expecting to achieve different results than we've achieved every time in the past, then we would be insane if we approached this debt limit discussion uh, with the same kinds of, of tired 
malfunctioning, uh, unproductive uh, strategies that have been employed in the past, strategies that, re that, that focus exclusively on immediate cuts or even long-term cuts. Let me explain what I mean. As we approach the debt limit discussion, there will be those who will want to focus a lot of the attention on long-term spending cuts. In other words, they might say, if we're going to raise the debt limit by a trillion dollars, then we need to find a trillion dollars in cuts that can be made. If we're going to raise it by two trillion dollars, then we need to find two trillion dollars to cut. But of course, we can't cut a trillion dollars out of our budget immediately. Uh, that's not possible. We can't do that in one year. It would have to be stretched over a period of many years. Most likely, in this scenario, as it's been discussed, it would be stretched over a period of a decade or more. Now, we do have the power to control what we do in this Congress, but we can't bind the Congress that will take power in January of 2013 or in January of 2015 or 2017. Every two years, we get a new Congress in place, and that Congress has the power to make those decisions that will best fit what they decide is in order at that time. We can't bind them permanently. And so any promise that we make right now to cut, let's say, $2 trillion relies on the promise that that will be honored by future Congresses. We can't bind them to do that. There is one way, however, that we can bind them. That is by amending, for the 28th time, that 224-year-old document that has fostered the development of the greatest civilization the world has ever known. When we amend the U.S. Constitution, that is the one credible way, the one binding way in which one group of Americans can bind a future group of Americans. And that's why I've said that the only circumstance in which I think it's appropriate for us to raise the debt limit is a circumstance in which Congress has first passed a balanced budget amendment out of Congress by the requisite two-thirds margin in this body and in the House of Representatives and submitted it to the states for ratification. In that scenario, and only in that scenario, can we proceed with any degree of confidence that the commitments we make now to the American people to make not just immediate cuts, but long-term changes to the way that we spend money. It's only in that scenario that those promises can be and will be honored, because it's only in that scenario that we can bind a future Congress. That's why I've pledged to vote against and to oppose in any way I can any debt limit increase uh, that involves something short of prior passage of a balanced budget amendment, in addition to any caps, in addition to any immediate cuts that may be made. So we've got to have cuts. We've got to have some kind of spending cap where we cap spending as a percentage of gross domestic product every year, and we've got to have a constitutional amendment requiring that and requiring that revenues and outlays match each other from year to year. If we don't have this, then we're at great risk for the practice of perpetual deficit spending, in which Congress year in and year out spends more than it takes in. Now, Congress can sustain this for a period of time, but where as is now the case, the amount of money that Congress spends is in excess of $1.5 $1 trillion a year, more than it brings in. We've reached a certain point of unsustainability, a point at which, if we continue with this practice, we'll get to the point where a halt in borrowing will be much more immediate, much more draconian than anything that could be within our control. At some point, those who would be willing to loan us that money, who'd be willing to buy U.S. Treasury instruments of one form or another to finance our debt, will eventually start demanding a higher and a higher yield, which means that instead of spending about $250 billion a year on interest on our national debt, as we're currently paying, the time could very soon come in which we might have to pay something closer to $700 billion a year just to pay the interest on our national debt. In fact, if we were now required to pay interest rates on our, our, our treasury instruments 
that are consistent with the 40-year average, we'd be about there. Now, $700 billion is a lot of money. $700 billion in a year is roughly what we spend on Social Security. It's roughly what we spend on Medicare and Medicaid combined in a year. It's roughly what we spend in national defense in an entire year. If we have to spend that amount of money every year, as we could easily have to spend within just a few years' time if we continue spending at this rate, that's going to crowd out funding for every federal program out there. So whether you're most concerned, as many conservatives might be, about protecting national defense, or whether you're most concerned, as many liberals are, about protecting our entitlement programs, you ought to insist, as I've insisted, that we will not raise the debt limit until such time as Congress has passed a balanced budget amendment to the U.S. Constitution. That's why I'm pleased to support the cut, cap, and balance pledge, and why I will continue to take this position, in addition to standing firm on my position, that we ought not even consider any tax increase at a time when we can least afford it. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I suggest, suggest the absence of a quorum.